What's that? That's kind of the subtitle of my book. But uh, I'll let you, you can look at it more. <laughs> Um, I have a case of them. Actually, I just got a notification from UPS saying that they're out for delivery today. I've got a box of 35 coming today. Um, so anyone that wants to, I can get one for you. Awesome. I love that. Um, but as a result, I thought this would be a good opportunity to try to do some type of presentation on the general concepts and ideas. And while Conceptually, that makes a lot of sense. It's really hard to take a book and condense the material into presentation. So um, hopefully this doesn't feel super disjointed as I, as I go through it. But um, the, uh, the first thing I kind of want to talk about is these concepts of dieting and exercise. And I don't believe in dieting and exercising. And I know that sounds weird from somebody who has made their career in fitness and nutrition and health. Um, but when I say stop dieting and exercise, the reason I say that it's more, it's not about the practices. It's not about the behaviors. It's more about the expectations of what those words mean specifically. Because when I ask someone, you know, why, are you on this diet or why are you doing this exercise program? Um, what are the most common answers, do you think? Lose weight. Lose weight. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. It usually, and I, I want to say usually because it's not always the case, but usually it's because of an outcome. Diet and exercise the concepts connote an outcome, that we are doing it for some purpose larger than ourselves, to change ourselves. You know, very rarely do we say, I'm dieting or exercising just because it's what brings me the most joy. Um, I'm sure there are people like that, but most people look at exercise like, oh, I've got to go to the gym. Or they're on a diet and they think, if I have to eat one more rice cake, I'm going to go crazy or whatever the whatever the fat is. And so we start to look at those words based on the outcome and the process. And we've talked about the concepts of motivation before. Uh, we'll revisit it today. But being motivated by fear and obligation, something external out of ourselves, we're doing something for somebody else, or we're doing it somebody else's way, versus a process is when we are inspired by just that, by living, doing the activity in and of itself. Um, and our culture plays a big part of this, and we'll talk about how culture has changed a little bit, but our bodies were not designed to diet and exercise. Think about your parents even, your grandparents. How many of them made a standard practice of dieting or going to the gym, to exercise, right? You know, we, we kind of come from the evolutionary stance of survival of the fittest, right? And we had to raise the food that we ate and all these things and work for it and we knew where it came from. So all of these different things um, came into play and there were times where there was a lot of famine even. And I don't think that in those times when people are struggling for food on their table, in the back of their mind, they're going, man, I know I'm starving, but I really need to get to the gym and work on my, my running pace or my cardiovascular fitness. Right? Those are concepts. Diet and exercise are concepts that are relatively new. And they're relatively new to our culture. And because of that, it has changed the way our bodies respond. Because of the way that we have evolved, we came from that background of feast or famine, work for what we eat, and, and now our lives are kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. Everything in our lives is designed to create ease, right? It's not uncommon that we spend the majority of our day sitting down, having things done for us, right? It, everything in life is geared to to ease. Go into the store, hop in the car, 
drive to the store, get anything you need, come back. It requires very little effort on our parts. And so because the circumstances have changed with the way that we live, that does require that we have to make some type of metabolic expenditure because we're not having to work for it anymore. And, and the food that we are eating isn't as nutrient dense or nutritious. And so it's this, this kind of vicious cycle that we've been stuck in. And it, uh, it was a light bulb to me a few years ago, and it's really what the catalyst was for me writing the book and creating this message. Um, it was a, um, an article that came across my newsfeed one morning, and that, that top quotation is the name of the article. It was called, How a Fatally, Tragically Flawed Paradigm Has Derailed the Science of Obesity. And I thought, oh man, this is awesome. Let's read what it says. And that paradigm that it's talking about, the tragically flawed paradigm, is this concept that weight and obesity are the same thing, or weight and obesity are the same thing, right? Weight is not a metric of obesity. Weight has nothing to do with obesity or unhealth. The number on the scale tells me how much force my body is against gravity. But if I had two people standing here next to me, right, one on this side and he's a bodybuilder, right, 5% body fat, six feet tall and 200 pounds, okay, I don't think we would consider him overweight by our standards. This side, same height, same weight, but body fat percentage is 25 to 30. There's a big difference between these two individuals and the weight is exactly the same. BMI is exactly the same too because they're the same height. And so we look at this idea that weight has something to do with obesity in the epidemic, it doesn't. But because that paradigm where the focus has been on weight, it has created this, this vicious cycle of capitalizing the health industry. Um, we, uh, we look at diet and exercise programs as more about the product that they are or the service that they are than how we are going to be individually impacted by it or why we are even doing it in the first place. And so we've got this system, this society, this culture that told us weight's the problem and then also provides the solution to the problem. And the solution that they said is what? How do we lose weight? Diet and exercise. And it's surprising to a lot of people that there is a lot of misunderstandings about those concepts. And the more that we look at um, concept of exercise, we find that exercise itself, I believe, is the single most important decision that we can make for ourselves, for our overall health and longevity, and at the same time, has almost nothing to do with weight loss. Calories out doesn't have a lot to do with our body composition management. That's almost exclusively what we're putting into our body. But part of that paradigm was convincing us that diet and exercise are the same. We've talked about that the last couple of weeks. We talked about a different approach to exercise, different approach to, to nutrition. Um, and then this is kind of the final piece that brings those together. But uh, if you had to guess, if we um, did an inventory on society and said, are you happy with the way that you look? What percentage of the population would say they are happy with the way that they look? Everything. 10%? 5%? Thankfully, they're not that low. But just as stark, it's 23% for women and 25% for men. So at most, a quarter of the population is happy with where they are at physically and how they look, right? So that means that nearly three quarters of the population of this country is dissatisfied with the way that they look. 
that creates a pretty wide customer base. If I can say I can develop a product or a service that is going to meet the needs of 75% of the people, that's a pretty good business venture, right? And so we look at this, um, this is a marketing equation for sales. And this equation says that current dissatisfaction with who we are, where we're at, and I mean, that's applied to this concept, current dissatisfaction times the future promise of a program, exercise, or a diet is greater than cost times fear. We don't consider these concepts of why we are doing it. We're doing it for the right reasons, the wrong reasons, and what the cost might be if we are convinced that the future promise is gonna be greater. And so we have this, we've created this mixed message, this paradigm where most of us go around doing things the wrong way for the right reasons or doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Um, and that has contributed not only to misunderstandings about obesity and the health epidemic, but also um, mental health, emotional health. That paradigm, that obsession with a number on a scale that means absolutely nothing to me or my health leads to things like addiction, not addition. There should be a C in there. It does not lead to mathematics. Addiction, um, things like body dysmorphia, right? An actual diagnosed mental emotional condition where a person sees themselves differently than they actually are, right? And that then leads to patterns of disordered eating. Controlling, we can find a, think that, you know, we feel out of control a lot in life. And the one thing that we have control over is what we're putting in our body. And we use that control and it causes some of this patterns of disordered eating and dieting. Patterns of disordered eating and dieting cause hormonal havoc within the body. Because we are constantly changing what we're putting into our body and how much we're moving and all of these things. And so the body is never able to establish a homeostasis of where we're at to, to um, hormonally respond to normal metrics like the food that we eat. Um, it allows us to procrastinate progress. It's another cultural thing here, right? We're obsessed with starting dates and time frames, right? The biggest goal setting day of the year is when? April 1st, or January 1st. Um, and if it's not a New Year's resolution, it's okay, I'm gonna start tomorrow morning, or I'm gonna start next week or next month. And we have these ideas and concepts that allow us to procrastinate our progress when everything that we do is ultimately moving us, right? Um, so procrastinating progress is, is a cultural thing too. Chasing perfectionism, this one I think has done more damage than anything is because not only we do, do we have the mixed messages with um, promises that have ridiculous expectations, they take people that look the part and they serve as the face of these products and services, right? And so in my mind, I say, I look at this person on this advertising and say, oh, that person used this product and they look like that. I'm gonna look like that. And I start to have these expectations, even if I don't really care. If I don't care that that's, if I don't wanna look like that person, that's what society wants. And so I start to think that's what I need to be. And the worst part about chasing perfectionism is it's never ending. This is a constantly moving target. And so we never achieve what we set out to, to achieve when we begin because it's a constantly moving target away from us. It's like chasing the end of a rainbow, right? The closer you think you get it, all of a sudden it's moved. And then ultimately it contributes to a loss of autonomy, the self-esteem, self-concept, self-actualization. We don't actually know who we are or what we want to do because we're too busy meeting the expectations and the standards and chasing 
perfectionism everywhere else. And we get lost in the thick of it. And so really, we have to start with intention. We have to start with asking ourselves why in all things that we do. Um, I love this concept of flow. Uh, everyone has probably seen a music performance or an athletic performance where they everything just was perfect. And sometimes even in an interview afterwards, they say I was such in, in a flow state. It just was so natural, right? So flow is defined as, or well, flow is the process of cultivating authentic joy in our lives. So that's the overall purpose, but it's a state in which one is so involved in what they are doing that nothing else matters. Completely focused in that moment, nothing else is a distraction, and the experience is so enjoyable that they continue even at a great cost just for the sheer sake of doing it. How many people do you think in the world could look at their systems of diet and exercise and say, yes, I love it so much that nothing else matters and I'm willing to do whatever to continue it even if I don't get anything from it without any outcome. Um, so we look at flow in our life. Our, the flow state, cultivating joy, is a purposeful, intentional pursuit. And that's why whys are so important. Because you might have 90% of the population say, I want to lose weight, but every single one of those millions of people want to lose weight for a different reason. And we don't look at that. We don't look at the intention behind it. Um, all right, let's move on here. So we have talked about this concept before, so I'm gonna just really quickly touch on it. Motivation is a big um, piece of that paradigm, being motivated or motivating. Uh, one of my favorite speakers, and I've quoted him in these presentations before, I listen to different talks of his almost every day. His name is Simon Sinek. And just three or four days ago, he was, I was listening to a, a segment on leadership. And he said, leaders, all leaders in the world only have one thing in common. And that one thing in common is followers. Every leader has followers. But there are two ways in which people follow. Leaders either lead by manipulation or they lead by inspiration. Those are the options. And so if I have followers that want to listen to who I am, it's because I'm either manipulating or I'm inspiring. And we see that in every area of our life. We see it in religion, we see it in politics, we see it with, with sports, we see all of these different dynamics, um, but it's all geared toward um, the outcome, motivated, not inspired. So, well, we, let's talk, before we talk about inspiration. Motivation um, is what? How would we define motivation? Reason to do something. Yeah, encouragement. And so we have internal and external motivators. Which is more powerful for us individually? External. What did you say? External. You say external, okay. External motivators, why would that be more for you? Because I tend to be lazy. Okay. So is that an external problem or an internal problem? <laughs> we look for motivation outside of ourselves. We look for inspiration outside of ourselves. And that's why there are personal trainers in the world. And that's why there are therapists and life coaches that give direction. Um, but when it comes to motivation, the definition of motivation is having a goal and doing whatever it takes to get to that goal. That's what motivation is. 
So we've got an end result in mind, and then I'm gonna take the steps necessary to get to that goal. Well, inspiration is the opposite. It's the opposite. It's, it's ultimately being pulled in the direction of where you naturally are gonna go. Now, um, there's a story that, uh, that I really like about Mozart, the composer. And there was a young composer that was a teenager who came up to him and said, I would love it if you would teach me to write symphonies. And um, Mozart responded and said, maybe you should uh, start with some minuets. And, and the, the, the young composer was angry and said, well, you were writing symphonies when you were my age. And Mozart's response, it was humble and very direct and honest. It was like, yeah, but I didn't have to ask anyone how to do it. Mozart was inspired. He saw, he talked about his creative experience of writing music as he heard it in his mind and saw the notes on the page at the same time as he wrote. He was inspired, and so he moved to what he was inspired to do versus this young composer who's trying to be motivated into that same behavior. If, now, now who, I would say, who is going to be more effective at the end result if we're looking at music? Yeah, the inspired one, every single time. And so the more we can let go of the outcomes and look at the processes, that's going to be the, the, biggest, um, the biggest telltale sign there. Now, this, if there is one concept that I hope people take away from, from my book and from this presentation today, it's this idea of this, this continuum. And I wrote it down four times because it's important that everything matters. And what that means is that every single decision, action, behavior, thought, everything in our lives has implications to it, right? There's an equal and opposite reaction there is a response to every single thing that we do. If we look at our diet, right, and on this end of the continuum is optimal, perfect health, and this over here is sickness and death. Every single thing that I put in my body is going to move me closer or further away from where I want to be. Some of those things are really small, some of them are really big, but everything matters. Every step I take or don't take has implications on my longevity and health. Every thought I have, negative or positive, has implications on how I feel that day, what decisions I might make. And very often we are so focused on the external, outside of ourselves, outcomes, doing things for the wrong reasons, for someone else's standard expectation, that we never even consider these small things that might move that needle. Um, and it just so happens that it's not the big things. Right? People start a diet or an exercise program because they want the end result. Right? And so they make a big investment, they work really hard for, for that result. Okay? But if we go back to what the person was experienced that led to them wanting to do that diet or exercise program, the way they were living, um, we see that it's the little things. It's not the big decisions of starting or stopping a program or doing things, it's the little things. It's the seemingly inconsequential decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis that have the most impact over time compounded over time. It's the little tiny concessions that we give ourselves, right? We know something isn't good for us. We, we don't feel good about it, 
But we do it anyway because that's the way that we've always done it. But every single thing matters. And even more beautiful is that it all provides contrast. And that contrast is what ultimately allows us to experience life and cultivate that joy that we're talking about. So when I say contrast, it's the idea of two opposite points on a, on a scale, right? So we've all heard these concepts like, um, without great pain, you'll never know real joy, right? If I, ex if I have never experienced real pain, I have no frame of reference for joy. When we look at our emotions on this spectrum like that, it provides contrast and experience. And the more contrast and experience we have, the more full our lives are. Um, I wrote, there's a chapter in the book about my dogs. My two dogs, Marley and Pepper, because I see this idea in them completely. You know, Marley is Pepper's son. And so they are biologically um, related. And so you would assume that there would be some factors that are very, very similar. But when I take them to the dog park, their behavior is so completely different from each other. Um, they're both really excited to go and play, but Pepper, she's my older dog. She's five next week. And she goes straight to the dog park and spends the first 20 or 30 seconds trying to find a tennis ball anywhere, just frantically running around trying to find a ball and then brings it to me and lays down in front of me with the ball until I throw it. Um, if any other dogs come around her or that ball, she growls, she gets angry, and she's laser focused on that ball the whole time that we're there. Whether it's 10 minutes or an hour, she's either chasing the ball or staring at it in front of my feet. Marley, on the other hand, goes in and he doesn't care about the ball. He runs around and sniffs all the other dogs first, two or three times, that's what, they, that's what they do. And then he runs around the periphery of the dog park and says hi to all the individuals and gets his pets. And then he plays with the other dogs, running back and forth and you know, doing all of this stuff. And you know, both of them are enjoying their time. They're doing what they want to do. And I wonder, is, you know, would, would Marley benefit from more structure and dedicated focus? And would Pepper be better off if she was a little bit more free? Or do I just accept, you know, do they accept where they're at and what they want to do? And I know they're dogs and that doesn't necessarily um, have direct implications to us, but I bring that up because very rarely do we look at the intention um, behind our behaviors. You know, the dogs don't have the ability to um, intellectualize or, or think about it. If I were to ask Pepper, you know, why do you like to stay there and stare at the ball instead of going to play with the dogs? That's not a concept that they're going to do. But we as humans do have that capacity to ask ourselves why. Um, but to kind of pull all of these concepts together, I put together a conceptual framework. I love the idea of the Venn diagram because uh, especially for, for this um, specific concept, and I know Venn diagrams are usually only two circles, but each one of these four rings represents one of these things. So we have purpose, intention, inspiration, and process. Now, this shared place in the morning, in the middle, that has pieces of all of those, that perfect balance spot in the middle, is what I define as self-actualization, or living well, authentically living to, to our heart, our desires, our, our, ex, or our emotions. Um, and so we're gonna go through each one of these really quick because there is a, a separate question that we can ask ourselves with each one of these four rings. So the first one is purpose. That's the top ring. And the question associated with purpose is who am I? 
Now that's a philosophical question that most people at some point in their life are going to ask themselves, who am I? Now, this is a little bit hard to do because if I ask a person, who are you? What are they gonna tell me? Well, if, if I came up to you and introduced myself for the first time and said, who are you? What would you tell me? You tell me your name. Our name is not who we are. It's who our parents, it's what our parents decided to call us and identify us. But it's not who we actually are. You know, I'm identified as Jared, but I'm a lot more than Jared, right? So when you look at who I am, we're talking about the values associated the things that are important to us and not important to us. Those values make us up who we are. But that's usually not where we start. We usually start with the tangible. This is my name. This is what I do for a living. This is where I live. This is my family. This is what my schedule's like. But none of those tangible, quantifiable conditions have anything to do with who we are or our worth as an individual. And we have to start there. And so a, a good exercise to do that is to ask ourselves who I am, who am I? And, and use values, list it in values. So in, I'll just briefly show you in, in the book, the, uh, the exercise associated with this is I listed, because sometimes values are hard to come up with. So I made a list of all the values and then a person is going to choose 10 of those and write at the affirmations, I am that value. I am that value. And then the next part of that is what that value actually means to the person. Because sometimes, you know, honesty to one person means something very differently than it might to another person. And so values are very individual. So not only do we need to identify the values that are important to us, but that leads us to the next thing with why, why that's important. So intention is the second ring, and that one is who do I want to be? So we've already done self-reflection, who I am, value-based, and this is who do I want to be. Now, first thing to acknowledge there is who I want to be doesn't diminish any of who I already am, who I inherently am. We're not trading one value for another, right? We're adding contrast and experience by implementing those. So um, this is all about uh, cultivating those values that we admire in society and other people in our own lives. Um, so, and, and typically what we find is those values of who we want to be, the reason that that is a desirable value that is attractive to us individually is because we already have a part of that. Otherwise, it wouldn't be attractive to us. So we find that who we want to be is who we already are. But we're adding contrast and experience by adding values. And so the exercise associated with that one in the book is, you know, I admire this value. And then you do the same thing with the um, what that actually means and, and how that would look. But then it comes to this one, the inspiration, the third ring. And I would say this is the most important because it's the most transformational and requires the most from us. And that question associated with this is why do I want to be that person, the person that we just decided on the last slide? So who am I? Who do I want to be, but why do I want to be that person? This is a step that we don't ask ourselves usually because we're told by society already who we're supposed to be. But why do I want to be that person? Um, and, and the way to do that and the reason why we aren't, it doesn't feel like it comes naturally to us is because we are not taught enough about our emotional recognition, uh, recognition system, our emotions. 
to identify our emotions, and to really consider why we're feeling those emotions. You know, we know when we're sad, we know when we're happy, we know when we're mad, angry, frustrated, <laughs> resentful, whatever the emotion is, we are aware of the emotion, but how often do we self-reflect enough to say, why am I experiencing this right now? Or why did I respond that way to this circumstance? Um, and and uh, it's hard to do because it reveals the things that we don't like, that we don't like about ourselves. Because we've been told that they might be undesirable. But uh, the, the part of this is the one that I hope people return to on a regular basis. Because the, the exercises include recognizing positive emotions and then also writing and journaling about when we experience those positive emotions and what they feel like. And then we do the same thing with negative emotions. What negative emotions do we most often feel and experience? And what does that feel like? And when and where do we feel like we are experiencing those? And it's very revealing. And it usually helps us fill in the blanks with some of those other steps, with the values. And we have these clarifying moments that are like, yeah, I really don't care about weight loss. I just want to be healthy and happy, and I don't, you know, I don't need a six pack to be happy. That's their expectation, that's their happiness, and that's fine. But for me, this is where I'm at. But it's tied directly to our emotions, and we do not spend enough time on emotional recognition. In fact, in this society, a lot of times emotion is kind of looked down on. You know, from especially like mainstream gym uh, environment. I don't like gyms, fitness centers. I don't like the loud weights banging, the screaming, the, the focus on the external aesthetics. All these things just drive me crazy. Um, but, uh, but that doesn't mean that that's not right for somebody else. And I lost my center of thought because that was taking me somewhere. And now I, I'm totally in a different place. Um, yes, you can answer the why. <clears throat> you always can answer the why. You mean like, for what example? Well, part of, part of the answer, if, you know, it depends if it's something that is inherently who we are. Because I believe that if we don't like something within ourselves, that's a communication for us to understand what that's all about. And typically, it's because there's a societal expectation that's something negative. And so it requires this idea of radical um, acceptance of, who we are. And I didn't I skipped over that part in this because it's a little bit more woo-woo and out there. But we have to start with the foundation of self-love if we want to progress at all. We have to accept ourselves for all of our flaws, for all of the good, but also all the bad. It's that contrast. Right? We're usually really proud of ourselves for all the right reasons, and, and we are down on ourselves for some of the other things. And, and this is a lifelong process for all of us. Um, but, uh, but it starts with identifying you know, the, the emotion behind the behavior, the action, the thought. And so once we identify the... Uh, because when, when somebody says something like, I don't like this about myself, that the thing that they don't like could be any one of hundreds of emotional responses. You might not like it because it makes you angry. You might not like it because you might 
feel less than or sad or whatever it is. So we have to identify the emotion first, and then we can start to peel back the layers and ask ourselves, well, why is that important to me? And what, where did that thought come from? Um, we are way harder on ourselves than we are to other people. We say things to ourselves and judge ourselves way more harshly than we would ever judge another person or use words talking about another person. And that in and of itself is a good foundation to start on. That uh, we are all perfect, exactly who we are in this moment. No one needs to change at all. Everyone is completely perfect. And now if you decide that you want to progress and do something else that is your prerogative and no one else's, but everyone in the world is exactly perfect, the exact way that they are without any condition for any reason. Um, and then the last piece is the process. Now the process is the stuff that we've talked about the last couple of weeks in this, the you know, different way to approach exercise and fitness that's not so focused on the quantitative metrics and the outcome goals. And doing the same thing with our diet, not eating for an outcome, but eating for what makes us feel the best and provides the best experience. Um, but uh, the, um, I'm just gonna read this, because I, <laughs> our daily thoughts, behaviors, and actions that are congruent with our self-discovery and actualization, recognizing not only that everything matters, but also that we are in control of our experience regardless of the outcomes and expectations. That's where the magic happens, the process. When we find, when we've discovered who we are, really ironed out the traits who we want to be, the person that we want to become, um, why that is important to us individually, not based on the outcome or other people's expectations, and then how do we do it? How do we implement these little strategies to help us get there? We find ourselves in this beautiful place in the middle, this idea of flow where we're eating, living, exercising, I shouldn't say exercising, moving, <laughs> eating, and living based on what makes us the happiest. And it's funny, we were talking yesterday in the 